Now that we have a clear understanding of the model of labor markets, our next step is to apply our economic reasoning tools to labor issues that concern us both as individuals and societies. First, let's clarify how understanding derived demand in labor markets can be valuable to an individual who's looking for a good income and facing choices about education and training. Derived demand tells us that in order to make an income, we need to be mindful of the goods and services people want. We tend to have a general idea of what people want just by looking around us, but there are some other useful sources, particularly for students facing decisions about what to do after high school. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, the group responsible for the Consumer Price Index, and therefore very much in tune with what people buy, publishes every two years a forecast of the fastest growing occupational fields for the next decade. Check it out. It's not surprising that job growth is in the healthcare and information technology fields, is it? But note the other useful information, the projected income category, from very high to very low. Any surprises there? But you might be surprised by the last column in this table. While it's certainly the fact that people with higher levels of education tend to have higher incomes, this data tells us that there are viable alternatives to the college route to a good income. To be sure, it doesn't say anything about the value of education to individuals and society in the larger sense, but it does say that the message about going to college to get a good job may be more nuanced than it's typically presented to be. What the chart seems to be telling us is that education is the route to higher earnings, but that the term education needs to be interpreted more broadly than the four-year college degree, and that it probably includes heavy doses of on-the-job training and experience. Now, this table, on the other hand, clearly tells us that the on-the-job training entryway to high-income occupations is rapidly narrowing. And if we look more generally at downward trends in the labor market, well, here's some slightly depressing news. The list of occupations forecast to experience the greatest declines by industry rather than by income level. It still looks bad for some traditional jobs. I want to keep this slide up here for a moment and ask how alert you were as you skimmed the list of declining occupations. Because by now you should be protesting, hey, hold on a minute, derived demand, huh? Consumers haven't stopped wanting things on this list, clothes and cars and gas and farm products. Well, you're right, they haven't. But the question I have back for you is, who's making these things? Or more accurately, what's making these products now? Machines, 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 machines. Self-scanner, bye-bye store clerks. Online ordering, so long order clerks, robot callers, not so fast telemarketers. Computerized production lines, see you later production supervisors. Which brings us to another key to understanding income, both income of people and of nations, and that's productivity. The bottom line is that workers' income is a function of the value of what they produce their individual productivity. Labor productivity is measured as the output per worker per specified unit of time. So it could be output per hour or per day or even per year. More productive workers who contribute more to output earn higher wages. Some factors that contribute to productivity are specific to the individual. They're part of his or her human capital. And the most important thing people can do to improve their human capital, and thus their productivity, is to learn more through experience, through training, through formal education. Both the general education that teaches people how to think and reason and learn, and the knowledge specific to their jobs, makes workers more productive. And high on today's list of human capital is the ability to use information technology and the ability to work with other people. Other resource factors, like the availability of physical capital, also affect productivity. Remember our firewood splitting example? The mechanical log splitter certainly increased worker productivity 
That is, of course, assuming that the worker had the necessary human capital to run the machine, either from past experience or from the ability to read directions. With more capital, buildings, machines, tools, and technology, workers can be more productive, and individual workers who know how to use the capital that's available have higher productivity and higher incomes than those who do not. The Wessels Living History Farm in Nebraska provides a great illustration of how technological improvements in physical capital, in this case specifically the plow, drastically increased worker productivity in the United States over the past century. The link, which you can find in the lesson materials as well as on the screen, takes you to a video in which different technologies, starting with a horse-drawn plow and ending with a modern combine, are used to prepare a one-acre field for planting. Below the video on the, on the website is a link to the bottom line, and it has a chart showing the time reductions for plowing the same sized field as the technology improves. It's a great way to explain how it's possible that in 1900 most Americans were farmers, and today fewer than 2% are, and we're nowhere near running out of food. It's also a good piece of information to prompt discussions of labor-related issues like farm subsidies or the, quote, disappearing American farm. Another dimension to how capital affects productivity is larger than the individual worker or the machinery provided by his employer, and that's infrastructure. Lack of infrastructure is a key characteristic of poor countries. Nations without good education systems, for example, hold back their workers' ability to improve their human capital and productivity. Lack of infrastructure also constrains worker productivity regardless of how educated and capable the people are. India has incredibly high levels of literacy and education, but infrastructure? Yeah, not so good. Imagine how economic growth must be hampered in nations without dependable transportation and telecommunication systems. On the flip side, think about how infrastructure innovations like, for example, a whole new concept of phones, mobile telephones, can have a huge impact on the productivity of the poorest people. Within an industry, more productive workers generally earn higher wages than less productive workers. And technology is an important determinant of that individual productivity. Workers who have the training to use advanced machinery like computers or robots or even cell phones are more productive and thus they're more valuable to their employers and thus earn higher wages. Now, yes, machines mean fewer workers are needed, but they also mean that the ones who are are more productive and earn higher incomes. The observation that technology increases productivity and workers' incomes seems logical, but the importance of the insight often gets lost in the uproar that ensues when a new technology is introduced into an industry. The common perception that technology destroys jobs and hurts workers is a hard one to overcome, partly because there's a grain of truth in it. The particular workers who lose their jobs because of technological change or improvements certainly are hurt, but the history of economic change tells us that the number of jobs continues to grow. The type of job may change, but the number continues to grow. So while we can, can sympathize with the buggy whip makers, the technological advances that made the automobile possible certainly created more benefits than costs and more jobs than jobs that were lost. The same can be confidently sent, said about self-checkout scanning technology or internet ticketing, but it's certainly easier to say if you're not the checkout clerk or the travel agent. Okay, so quick review. Looking at the individual's choices and how they play out in labor markets to affect income, we've highlighted two important considerations. One, gauging your job preparation with an eye on the product markets. And two, being aware of things that impact your productivity and thus your value in that labor market. Now, let's go back to the labor market and look at how productivity impacts employers' decisions. They may not use the economic terminology, but when employers read job applications and conduct interviews, what they're trying to find out is how productive you are, because your productivity affects their profit. 
you could simplify it this way. What an employer is asking himself when making a hiring decision is, how much are you worth to me? And that translates into, how much more can I produce if I hire you? Okay, that seems like a reasonable question. The problem is that the answer is, it depends. And in addition to depending on the human capital of the workers and the availability of physical capital in the workplace and the nation's infrastructure, it also depends on something called your marginal revenue and the overriding reality of diminishing marginal returns. All right, so here's how that works. My business partner and I working together can build 18 feet of garden wall in a day. Okay. We decide to hire another person and we find that when the three of us work together, we can build 30 feet of brick wall. What is the worker we hired worth to our business? He's worth the marginal product. That is the difference in the value of what we produced with him and what we produced without him. In this case, 12 feet of garden wall. Whoa, now that's kind of surprising to us. Together, we were producing nine feet each, but the hired worker increased production by 12 feet. We're thinking this is a very good thing. So maybe we ought to try adding another worker and another and another. How'd we do? Hmm. The second worker was only worth 10 additional feet of wall, not the 12 we expected. Well, maybe it was just that worker. So we'll try another. But the next worker was worth eight and then six and then four additional feet. Total production is going up, but as alert business owners, we've also noticed that the additional benefit of hiring each additional worker is going down. This extra production that we can attribute to the addition of a worker is called the marginal product. Okay. Remember back to our earlier lesson on the margin? It means a little bit more or a little bit less. In our garden wall production, each time we add a little bit more labor, we're getting more produced. We started at 18 and with seven workers, we're up to 58. So that's good, right? Well, not necessarily because we need some more information. Like how much do we have to pay these workers? What's their work worth to us? We know that the workers are worth in terms of feet of garden wall, but we don't know what they're worth in dollars yet. So now we're back to the concept of derived demand and the market. The value of these workers is equal to the value of the products. In other words, we need to know the selling price for brick wall building. Let's make the math easy and say it sells for $15 a foot. Now, what's our first hire, that would be worker number three, worth to us? She increased output by 12 feet and at $15 a foot, that means she's worth $180 to us. In econ speak, we'd say her marginal revenue product is $180. What about the next worker? His marginal product was 10 feet, and at $15 a foot, his marginal revenue product is $150. And the next worker, 8 feet at $15 a feet, $120. You get the idea, and we can fill out the rest of the chart. But wait a minute. All these people are doing the same job, have the same skills, work just as hard. I can interchange them. You assign them different parts of the job each day without really thinking about who's doing what. So how come they're not all worth the same amount? The explanation is called the law of diminishing marginal returns. And it says that ceteris paribus, remember that ceteris paribus means all else being equal. And that's very important. Adding more units of one resource to a fixed amount of other resources results in diminishing marginal returns. Okay, let's take that apart. My partner and I own the wall building company. We have fixed resources, one truck, two wheelbarrows, one cement mixer. Okay. We're going to add units of labor. 
When I add another worker, I get additional output because of specialization and division of labor. We divide up the tasks and we become more efficient. So we add another worker, more specialization, more division of labor, not as much of a gain, not as much more output as the first addition of labor. We still gained more total feet of garden wall was produced, but there wasn't as much additional gain with each additional worker. Okay, so it's this diminishing margin that influence how much I'm willing to pay workers. If the first worker increases revenue by $180, I'd be willing to pay up to $179.99 to get him. Because at the end of the day, my income would be one cent more than if I hadn't hired him at all. Behind the scenes in every labor market are employers trying to estimate workers' marginal revenue product so that they know what to offer employees and still make profits. In our wall building example, how many workers should I hire then? I know the market price for a foot of wall, $15 a foot. I know how many additional feet will be produced by each additional worker and what that output is worth to me. What we haven't taken into consideration yet is how much do I have to pay to get them to work for me? And what determines that? Remember, wages are prices and prices come from, right, a market. If there are lots of prospective employees competing for the jobs in our market, I may be able to offer them a lower pay than their marginal revenue product and still hire them. So let's say the prevailing wage is $100. If that's true, then I'm way ahead to hire three workers. But if supply and demand in the market pushes the wage to $125, then I'm only going to hire two. Thus, diminishing marginal returns takes some of the mystery out of the hiring and layoff process, although it may still seem pretty mysterious if you're in the middle of the job search or layoff process. This diminishing marginal returns thing is kind of an interesting phenomenon. It seems to be saying that as a worker, your productivity may be affected by something you can't do anything about, the number of other people on the job. And yes, I guess that's the case, but it's not entirely true that you have no control over things. You do have options. They may not be easy, but they're options. Basically, what you have to do is make yourself unique so that you're not interchangeable with so many other workers. That's essentially the story of people who become more and more educated or skilled in their fields. They're increasing their marginal revenue product to the point where there are few others who can compete with them. It's also a big part of the story of superstars, one-of-a-kind people with huge incomes. Some labor markets actually work somewhat like a tournament. Their high demand is only for the people at the very highest productivity, that is, the people with the highest marginal revenue product. So there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people who write books. There's only one J.K. Rowling. In sports and entertainment, People at the very top earn much, much, much more than those with similar, but not quite tournament winning skills. We see the same phenomenon in business, where, for example, the top salesperson earns a higher percent commission than all the others, or where firms compete for the most talented CEOs by offering them huge salaries, stock options, and plush retirement packages. The other key to the income of superstars is technology. Just as technology can increase the productivity and income of ordinary workers, it can vastly increase the productivity of superstars. Steve Jobs, obviously technology made him rich, but technology is also the not so obvious part of the explanation for the incomes of a lot of other rich people, like J.K. Rowling. Think of how her income is increased by advances in printing and shipping technology 
that allowed literally millions of pre-ordered copies of her books to be delivered for sale in a single day after it was issued. She only writes one book at a time, but technology still leverages her productivity. Think about Oprah's income if she was restricted to providing her entertainment product to just the people in the studio for each show. Yeah, she'd be rich, but with the technology, her income soars because it makes her product instantly available to millions of people. Now, we may not always be sure that we like all the lessons that our students learn from superstars, but at least in terms of the labor market, this lesson is sound. Find your unique skills and interests, work at a job you enjoy, and use technology to leverage your time and income. Let's switch now to some of the issues associated with labor that may be more contentious and about which people tend to have real strongly held opinions. This is probably a good time to remind ourselves about economic reasoning proposition number five and to suggest that those strongly held opinions are only as good as the evidence that backs them up. First up, the issue of labor unions. The question for us being how our institution of labor markets is affected by this second institution, labor unions. To conduct our analysis, we have to make connections back to our previous lesson on market power. So, review question. How is a supplier able to exert market power? Boot, time's up. The answer is by controlling the quantity supplied. We're back to that confusing thing about who's the supplier and who's the demander in a labor market. Remember that workers are the suppliers. So a labor union generates market power by controlling the supply of a particular type of labor that's available to employees. Unions do this by setting standards for membership. And in some places, through laws and policies, they restrict employment to only union members. The purpose is to raise the wages and benefits. Is this good for the workers? Well, yes, for those workers who have jobs. But remember that the union is restricting the number of workers who have jobs. Also remember that workers are consumers and higher wages increase production costs and therefore the prices of products to all consumers. So it's a trade-off and people have different opinions about whether the trade-off is worthwhile. Some general background. In the United States, there's a significant trend to declining union membership in the private sector of the economy, but not in the public sector, like teachers and other government employees. In the past decade, union membership has fluctuated around 12% of employed workers, compared to say 20% in 1983, the first year that comparable union data was collected. In real numbers, this means about 15 and a half million unionized workers, compared to about 17 and a half million in 1983. You can always check these numbers for updates on the BLS news release that is put out about January each year. In some ways, the composition of the numbers is even more interesting than the numbers themselves, because the private sector is bigger than the public sector, so individual union members are more likely to be employed by private firms. But if we compare the unionized percentages of the total private sector and public sector workforces, there's a significant difference. Workers in the public sector are nearly five times more likely to be union members. I'd venture to say that most people would find that surprising. I mean, we all had history textbooks that told the story of intrepid unions standing for workers against the power of big corporations. And we may not have considered that that story has changed. While it's a longer story for a different class, the, the summary version is that economists have identified several factors that help to explain the different rates of unionization in the private and public sector. Two of the most important are the pr improved wages and working conditions of the private sector, and second, the lack of a profit-motivated entrepreneur in the public sector who would constrain the growth of wages and benefits. Here are a few more generalizations about union membership that are provided in the BLS reports, and you might 
see this as an interesting source for future reference. A second labor market issue that tends to generate strong opinions is laws and regulations that change the income of various segments of the labor force by affecting supply or demand. Prime example, and the one your students are likely to find interesting, is minimum wage. Essentially, the minimum wage law substitutes an administered price for a market price. It's a, a classic price control, and it works in the same way as price controls on other products, gasoline, rental rates, or anything else that's sold in markets. By disrupting the information signals that markets depend on, price controls keep markets from adapting to changing conditions. Price controls may be well intended, but this is a great opportunity to show students the importance and, yes, the responsibility to look beyond intentions to results. The graph picture looks like this. Ceteris paribus, employers have a demand for workers, and the quantity they demand depends on the price, that is, the wage, that they must pay. Workers supply labor, and the number of workers willing to supply labor, again, depends on the price or the wage that they're offered. The interaction in the labor market generates an equilibrium wage. The philosophy behind minimum wage legislation is that our society regards the market wage as too low to provide low-skilled workers with an acceptable income, and that the situation can be remedied by requiring that employers pay a minimum wage above that equilibrium. The graph illustrates the impact. What we get is a surplus of labor, which is another way of saying increased unemployment. But let's tell the story in words. Remember that the employer pays workers based on their productivity and hires people to the point where their marginal revenue product equals the marginal wage. But now the wage has to be higher than that equilibrium. And the result is that the employer can no longer gain by hiring that last or marginal worker because the worker isn't that productive. So the worker loses his job or isn't hired at all. Now true, the workers who kept their jobs may have higher incomes, but the cost is borne by the laid off or not hired workers with no income. And that's only half the story. On the supply side, we have people whose willingness to sell their labor is also determined by the price or the wage. Some people will not enter the labor force at an equilibrium wage, but at a higher, say the minimum wage, they will. This is the stay-at-home mom or the student who says, boy, at $7 an hour, it's not worth it for me to get a part-time job. But if the minimum wage is $8 or $8.50, wow, maybe it is. So the minimum wage pulls into the labor market people who weren't there at the equilibrium wage, meaning that the quantity supplied of labor is greater. But remember that at the higher wage, Employers are hiring future, fewer people, not more. Their quantity demanded for workers has gone down, which means that the unemployment level rises. And as you might guess, then, who's going to lose their jobs or who's not going to get hired? The greatest impact of minimum wage legislation is on entry-level, first-time, and unskilled workers whose level of productivity is reflected in that equilibrium wage. Just because a law or a regulation says that a worker is worth a particular wage doesn't mean that he really is in the market. The proof is in his marginal revenue product, and if it's below the minimum wage, he won't be hired. The trade-off is clear here. Fewer jobs for unskilled workers, but higher wages for those who are hired. Is this a good trade-off for us to make? Well, that's not an easy question, is it? One thing the evidence tells us is that increases in the minimum wage raise unemployment among the most vulnerable sectors of the labor force, new, inexperienced workers, and those with lower skills. And here's an interesting piece of evidence, also among minorities.
suggesting that the minimum wage lowers the cost to employers who want to discriminate. Very importantly, there's one other exception to this analysis of minimum wage that we need to talk about. And you may have experienced it in your area at some point in the last decade. What if the equilibrium wage in the market is higher than the legislated minimum wage? Well, then the minimum wage legislation doesn't affect the labor market because essentially it's irrelevant. The market has moved beyond it to balance quantity supplied and quantity demanded of labor at a higher wage. Now, you could say, even though it doesn't have an effect in the economic realm, it does have an effect in the political realm because the politicians can say that they supported low skilled workers in this country by voting for that legislation. Minimum wage laws aren't the only legislation that affects labor markets. Other laws and regulations that could impact labor markets include things like OSHA, safety regulations. They raise employers' costs of hiring workers. And so again, we ask, what does that do to the demand for workers? I mean, we do have to take that into account. It's a trade-off between workplace safety okay, and number of workers getting jobs. Also impacted federal and state child labor laws that reduce the supply of unskilled labor by restricting the hours and occupations that minors may work. Protesters who want to ban trade with countries that allow child labor are facing the same issue. We see it historically in the study of American history. If we look at the evidence, each of these cases, we have to ask ourselves if it's possible that these children are working because it's the best alternative they have, not because someone is forcing them to take their worst alternative. Immigration policy. Do immigrants steal jobs or do they fill jobs no one else wants? That's complicated enough to be a whole course in itself, but your ability to analyze labor markets provides you with some insight beyond just your gut feelings about these issues. What about trade policy? Do the WTO protesters understand the consequences of closing sweatshops for workers in poor countries? What are their alternatives? Why are they working in these sweatshops in the first place? Unemployment. That'll be our last labor market issue for this lecture. We'll just touch on it briefly here and then explore it and some other issues in greater depth in the assignment. But first, let's start with the definition. Contrary to what many people think, unemployment doesn't include everyone who doesn't work. It is instead that portion of the labor force that is actively seeking work and cannot find it. So we need a definition of the labor force. If you're not looking for work, the government doesn't count you as being in the labor force, and therefore you don't figure in the unemployment calculations. It's like saying that you have to step into the labor market in order to be part of the employment unemployment figures. There's some criticisms of this method, but for now, it's what we deal with. The percentage of the labor force that is looking for work and not finding it. The Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates the unemployment rate by first determining the number of people in the labor force and then calculating what percentage of that labor force has been unable to find work. Now note that because of these definitions, it's entirely possible for the employment rate and the unemployment rate to rise at the same time or fall at the same time. Okay. The other important thing to bring home to students about unemployment is that it occurs for a variety of reasons and while it's sometimes detrimental to workers well-being, that's not always the case. Nor is it always the case that unemployment is bad for the economy. Think of it this way. All sorts of resources are unemployed from time to time and we don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with the market as it moves resources to their most valued uses. For example, a farmer could decide not to plant a field because the last year's crop prices were so low, but we don't moan about land unemployment. We trust that either the crop will become profitable again and he'll plant next year, or it won't, and eventually he'll sell the land to someone with a more valuable use for it. We're okay with that for land or capital. But unfortunately, when labor's unemployed, we immediately see gloom and doom. Now, that's understandable from a human perspective. 
but it overlooks that unemployment is a natural and necessary part of the process of markets adapting to the changing wants and needs of consumers. Without unemployment, we wouldn't be able to reallocate workers to produce different or new products. We tend to accept the reallocation process as pretty normal when it comes to laying off machines and natural resources that were used to produce a good that no one wants anymore. But we have a harder time accepting the laying off of workers that accompanies that same reallocation process. Now, I'm not trying to ignore or belittle the loss to individual workers, but we do mean to emphasize that there are often positive benefits from the processes that led to their unemployment. And that means we need to change our focus from maybe preventing the job loss to thinking about how to help the worker fit into that changing labor market. The other reality is that not all unemployment is the result of people being laid off. People actually opt for unemployment from time to time, maybe because they see the handwriting on the wall by the robot that's going to take over their job, maybe, or because they see other productive opportunities to explore rather than waiting to be made obsolete in their current jobs, or because an investment in education or training makes their current job not fit their abilities as well as it once did. This dynamic process of workers trying to find the best match for their labor is an important part of a healthy economy. So whether legislation and regulation is designed to reduce unemployment, pr promote employment, protect workers, it has both costs and benefits. And our purpose here is not to promote a particular policy or position, except the position that we have a responsibility to analyze the impact of the policies we support. Economic reasoning gives us the tools to identify costs and benefits and to evaluate the consequences of changing the rules of the game that affect labor markets. We'll look at some of these in more detail in the assignments for this lesson. But the important thing is that you now understand that it's not enough to ask, why was this policy enacted or who was it designed to help? The pertinent questions to ask in order to evaluate whether the policy is more than just good intentions include things like, what incentives are created by these additions or changes to the rules of the game? How are people's choices likely to be changed by these new incentives? How are supply and demand in the labor market impacted? If you can answer those three questions, then you're closer to being able to answer the really big ones. Does this policy actually help the people it was designed to help? And if it does, at what cost? One last look then at economic reasoning proposition number five before we leave the topic of labor with all of its emotional baggage. Understanding based on knowledge and evidence imparts value to opinions. In our effort to promote student self-esteem, we need to be careful not to err on the side of suggesting that all opinions are of equal value. As we discuss issues like child labor, immigration, and minimum wage, our goal as teachers should be to have the comment, that's my opinion, be the beginning rather than the end of a conversation. We need to teach students that the appropriate follow up to that's my opinion is an offer of evidence and explanation and a willingness to hear countervailing evidence. So to quote the remainder of economic reasoning proposition five, opinions matter and are of equal value at the ballot box. But on matters of rational deliberation, the value of an opinion is determined by the knowledge and evidence on which it's based. That brings us to the end of Lecture 5.2. And when we separate out the commentary, analysis, and examples, we're left with the following three big ideas. One, labor is bought and sold in markets that reflect the demand for goods and services. Two, Individuals' income is a function of their productivity, and technology has a huge impact on that productivity. And finally, other institutions in our society, like government and unions, can affect labor markets. They affect the supply of and demand for labor, they affect production costs, and they affect the prices of goods, services, and resources. And this also brings us to the end of the lectures for EOFT Part 1. 
As you finish up the course, please be sure to check not only the Lesson 5 assignments, but also the requirements and due dates for the term project.